Hello and welcome to our devotion for Tuesday, April the 5th. And we've been looking uh, this week at can we ask questions of God? And yesterday we looked at the fact that not only should we ask questions, but we should also understand that God is interested in us being involved in the process. Now, as we think about asking questions, probably the most uh, uh, powerful question that we are asked, most frequent, everything that we do is always around why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there sin and dysfunction in the world? And of course, uh, if you've been in the church for any length of time, we know that it's because sin came into the world. But today I want to give us why do bad things happen, kind of the big picture. And then for the rest of the week, we're going to look at some other things that we can uh, break this down in. But I want to look at the overarching picture. Now, God, by his very nature, is love. And he also is creative. And so he continues to create and then lavish his love on that which he creates. Now, as we look at scripture and then look at the world around us, it's obvious that God is wildly creative. Uh, if we look at all the species of animal that are out there right now, both in the sea and on land, we know that we have only scratched the surface of even discovering the breadth of everything that God created. But when God created human beings, he did something unique. Birds and reptiles and uh, mammals and fish and all these others work wonderfully on instinct, but you never see a bird going out and building a condo. You never see uh, a rabbit going, you know, let's uh, build a car. They work on instinct. All birds build nests if that's their instinct. They don't migrate away from that and start building something else. Human beings are unique. They are the part of God's creation that is uniquely said created in the image of God. Now let's take a look. In Genesis 1.26 we read this. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So we see that God created man in his image. And that doesn't mean that if he pulled out his wallet, we'd, uh, we'd go, oh, wow, they look just like him. That is not what he meant. He meant in the ability to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. He created us with the potential to be an equal, not like God, but to be equal enough to be able to have a relationship the way that a father has with a son, not the way that a master has with a pet. And so we've been given this unbelievable right. But for this to truly be the relationship that God called, we had to have total free will, the ability to completely live outside of his control, to make our own decisions, to live our life, not on instinct, but to truly have God-like qualities, which is we can see things that don't exist. We can look at the moon and go, we should build something to go there and have the capacity given to us by God to design that which could take us there to dream of it and to bring it into existence. That is the image of God that is born in us. But that same power gives us the ability to live completely separate from God. We can reject God's control in our life. We can reject every command that's in Scripture. And we can still live a life that will have a lot of blessing in it. It'll also have a lot of heartache. But at the same time, we are created uniquely in God's image. But that ability to rebel against Him also puts us in a very, very dangerous place, which means that we can completely pervert everything that God has. And He's given us that power. We know in Scripture, and I didn't put these in our notes today, but that uh, there was a rebellion in heaven before there was even on the earth, and that Satan was one of the angels that rebelled. Some people believe that as much as a third of the angels rebelled. But they were created in perfection, and they chose to walk into what they did not know, which was sin, a world apart from God. Adam and Eve in the same way, when God created man, he created them in his image after his likeness. And he put them in a garden in a place that was perfect. And yet they chose to disobey the command that was blatantly before them. In the day that you eat of this, you will know both good and evil. 
don't do it. Stay on the side where you only know good. Do not tread over to the side where you will know both good and evil. And yet, in the temptation, uh, it's God's holding out on you. There's something great. He knows good and evil. You only know good. He's holding out on you. And they bought it. They entered into it. And when they did, we read these words in Genesis 3.22. Then God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing both good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take hold of the tree of life and live forever. And so what we see here is a movement to knowing both good and evil. Now, God could have done the same thing he did with the angels, which was just cut them off and say there is no place for redemption. However, he decided, evidently, according to Scripture, to work backwards. He created imperfection with the uh, with the angels, they rebelled. He created imperfection with man. Man rebelled. He could have started all over again, but he didn't. He said, this time we're going to work backwards. Everyone is going to be born into a world permeated by sin, and they have to choose to obey rather than being born into a world that's perfect and choose to reject. So now, in my words, we're learning to hate sin the way that God hates it, knowing both good and and evil. Now, this is very important because the reason that heaven will be perfect is not because God won't allow sin, but because we totally know and completely understand the sick, dysfunctional nature of it. Unlike the angels, unlike man that was created in the garden, we will know both good and evil. And so we read in Romans 7.13, uh, Did that which is good then become death to me? And he's talking about the law. He goes, by no means, but in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Now, I hear people all the time say, how can a loving God allow the sin that is in the world? And what they really mean by that is, God shouldn't allow anything to happen that is hurtful or painful. But the thing is, we can't be set free from sin unless we totally understand what it is and we no longer desire it. Because I'm going to tell you that when I first gave my life to the Lord, I didn't want to, you know, die and be separated from God's presence, but I certainly didn't want to keep all of his commandments either. I had several sins I was planning on committing as often as possible. I was not convinced that sin was that bad. I knew that there were certain things that were really horrible, and if God would just stop those, I'd be really happy with a sinful world. But that's not God's plan. You see, people all the time go, well, why didn't he just stop the horrible stuff? And you go, then you end up with a tolerable world, not a perfect world. And there's a huge difference. You see, until we see Jeffrey Dahmer killing and eating people. Until we see Charles Manson doing uh, the uh, Labanka murders. Until we see Adolf Hitler burning people, an entire nation in furnaces. Until we see parents abusing their own children, we don't understand the dire consequences of where sin eventually leads. Now, this is a very interesting passage because as we look at the book of Revelation, we read that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. This is the ultimate goal, to take us back to perfection. But when he takes us back to perfection, he takes us back not being naive, but knowing both good and evil. And I don't know about you, but if I ever get out of this world and back into perfection, the chances that I will ever go back and choose this mess again are nil. I will never go back because I truly understand it. And Isaiah 66, 22 sounds just like Revelation when it says, as the new heavens and new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and your descendants endure. And from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And they will go and look out on the dead bodies of those that rebelled against me, and their worm will not die, their fire will not be quenched, and it will be loathsome to all mankind. Now, what does he mean by this? He means that at any time, if we forget what this crazy world was like, we can go back and look into it and see it and remember and know that rebellion will not be cast down because God doesn't allow it, but because we have seen the ugly, 
incompatible, uh, in, uh, infathomable nature of it. We have been overwhelmed by it. And then when we're set free, we don't rebel because of a knowing rather than uh, a forced, I will not give you free will. We will respond out of love. That's the reason God says that it, you know whether we sin a lot or sin a little matters dramatically here, but it doesn't mean that we're either accepted or rejected in heaven. The reason that heaven is for us is because if we let him be God, we have made the decision that we will no longer try to be God ourselves, which is what has to happen for us to have perfection and for rebellion to be cast down. And so we read in Revelation 21, 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now God's dwelling is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Now I would ask you, as a loving parent, if your child continued to do unhealthy or dysfunctional things and you constantly grabbed their arms and held them and restrained them so that they could not do it, but every fiber of their being wanted to go do it, at some point the only way they are going to be set free to understand what that is, if we, they will not respond to our protection, is to let them enter into it and experience it for themselves. Some people can be told the stove's hot and they're fine. Other people have to touch it. It would be great if we could go, oh, if God would just tell us, then we wouldn't go there. Well, duh. Anybody read the Bible? Anybody seen that? We reject it. It's like the Surgeon General's warning on the side of a pack of cigarettes. We all go, ah, well, it won't happen to me. You know, and then we go off in until all of a sudden there's lung cancer or there's uh, uh, some type of other stress in our system, and all of a sudden we go, oh man, I wish I hadn't made that decision. So God right now is allowing us to experience what sin is as a prevention so that eternity will be perfect. Created in perfection once, they rebel. Created in perfection twice, they rebel. This time we're gonna know both good and evil, and it is painful. It is horribly overwhelming, but it is preparing for us a future that will not be perverted. It's hard. Sometimes accountability is hard, but that's God's overarching plan. We'll look at more granular detail tomorrow, but that's the big picture. Let's pray. Father, I know for every one of us, when we're touched by sin, when... Uh, the effects of others and the world and, and all the things, or even our own decisions, begin to cave in on us. Lord, we want to go, God, why would you let this happen to me if you truly love me? But Father, when we step back far enough, we realize that you are helping us to discover what you have always known, that sin destroys everything that it touches. And Lord, until we understand that, we will never have perfection. Until we begin to hate sin the way that you hate it and stop entertaining the fact that a little bit's okay, and that uh, there are certain things that, we, that you call sin that we don't. And we think it's all good. Until we see where it truly leads us, we will never walk away from it. And we will never have perfection. Father, I thank you that you said you'd never let us walk so far that we would go out from under your watch, care, and your protection. That anything that we are affected by, that you will bind up the brokenhearted and heal their wounds. But God, help us to quickly learn to hate sin the way that you do so that when we stand in your presence, every tear will be wiped away from our eye and there will be no sickness or disease or mourning because that old order will be passed away. God, make this truth vibrate, resonate in every fiber of our being so that we will not experience heaven only after this life, but we will experience it every day of this life. And we look for you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, it's a big picture. More tomorrow.